Towns University and our Queens County District Attorney Candidate Forum. My name is Brian Brown. I'm the Assistant Vice President of Government Relations here at St. John's. I'm also an adjunct instructor in the Department of Government and Politics, and it's my privilege to be the moderator for tonight's discussion. On behalf of the President of St. John's University, Dr. Conrado Bobby Gempasoa, and the entire university community, we welcome you here tonight. Tonight, St. John's is joined with the NAACP Northeast Branch and the Queen's Daily Eagle newspaper to host this important event. In addition, this event is being telecast live on QPTV via broadband from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Spectrum channels 34 and 1995, RCN channel 82, and Verizon Flyers channel 34. The program will also be on the internet via QPTV's Facebook page, and will be rebroadcast for QPTV's approximately half 500,000 viewing audience here in Queens County. Thank you, QPTV, for your participation and support. Before I ask our co-sponsors to say a few brief words of welcome, I do want to announce that in accordance with Internal Revenue Code and University Policy, St. John's University is prohibited from participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective office. St. John's University does not endorse any particular candidate or political party affiliation, but we encourage all citizens to be engaged and involved in the political process. Now please welcome, from the Queen's Daily Eagle, Mike Nussbaum. Thank you, Brian. I want to thank uh, QPTV for giving us the time to share with the Queen's public this important debate in this important office, the District Attorney of Queens County. I also want to thank the NAACP and of course St. John's that have given us this space. The Queen's Daily Eagle is a daily newspaper covering the legal community of Queens. We cover the courts, we cover the legal community, and obviously this race is important not just to us, but to the people of Queens ongoing. And I'm proud of the reporters and the staff of the Queens Daily Eagle for what they're doing. We are covering this race almost every day. And the last week of the campaign, we're going to give each candidate some space, an opportunity to write what they would like, not what we write. So I again thank you and I thank St. John's and QPTV and the NAACP for sharing the stage with me. Thank you. Welcome Ken Cohen, Metropolitan Council Regional Director and President, NAACP Northeast Queens Branch. Ken? Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I'd like to thank the candidates for making this event. As you know, the NAACP has a rich history, 110 year old history, of providing information to the communities we serve. The Metropolitan Council is the 14 branches of New York City. This event is co-sponsored tonight by the five branches of Queens. That's Astoria, Long Island City, Corona, East Elmhurst, Far Rockaway, Jamaica Branch, and the Northeast Queens Branch. We welcome all of you. Please have your questions heard. And please listen carefully because in two weeks you will have to make a decision in the voting booth. So, welcome and thank you again. Thank you, Ken. We have a very ambitious evening planned for tonight with many candidates to hear from. Before we begin, I do need to take a brief moment to acknowledge all of the candidates and thank them for their participation in tonight's program. I also want to go over the format for the evening. Our evening is going to work like this. Individual candidates will be given 90 seconds each to make opening remarks. After each candidate has introduced themselves, the questions from our guest panelists will begin. The guest panelists will decide to whom and how the questions will be directed. If the question is meant for every candidate on stage, they will say so. Otherwise, they will direct their questions and frame the overall discussions. The panelists will determine how they wish to question the candidate and when and if there is any need for follow-up questions or clarifications. 
The panelists will decide what topics they wish to explore and for how long. Once the question is posed, the candidate will have within reason as long as they need to answer the question. Now my role tonight is to keep that within reason, and I will do my best to do so. Candidates should only answer the questions that are posed to them, and all of the candidates should be respectful of our overall time constraints. I will be the ultimate arbiter of our time and will endeavor to keep things moving. I ask the candidates in the audience to remember that there are many topics we seek to examine, and we want to keep the discussion moving. Over the next 90 minutes, around every 20 minutes or so, I will interrupt the proceedings for a lightning round of yes or no short answer questions that I will pose to the candidates. Also, please note that we will be collecting questions from the audience that I will pose to the candidates. If you have questions and you'd like to be directed to a specific candidate or all of the candidates on stage, please write that on your question and we will collect the index cards that are going around the room. We will conclude the evening with a final lightning round before each candidate is given one minute for closing statements. Before I introduce our panel of questioners, I do want to announce that uh, Melinda Katz's campaign did tell us in advance that she will be exiting the stage early, and we uh, agreed to that, and we appreciate her being here and acknowledge her schedule. Uh, she will not be given the opportunity to make closing statements, so you may want to factor that into your opening remarks as well. Justice Randall Eng. Justice Randall Eng is of counsel to Meyer Swazi English and Klein, PC. Immediately prior to joining Meyer and Swazi, Justice Eng served as the presiding justice of the Appellate Division Second Department, the busiest and largest judicial department in the state of New York. Um, born in China, Justice Eng was raised in New York City. He earned his undergraduate degree from the State University of New York at Buffalo and his Juris Doctor degree from St. John's University School of Law, class of 1972. Following law school, Justice Eng began his esteemed legal career in public service as an assistant district attorney in Queens County. At the time, he became the first Asian American appointed as an assistant prosecutor in New York State history, and he served in this role from 1973 to 1980. He then served as the deputy inspector general of New York City Correction, and later became inspector general. In 1983, Justice Eng became the first Asian American to become a judge in New York State when he was appointed to the criminal court of the city of New York by then Mayor Edward I. Koch. He sat in the criminal court until 1998 when he was designated as acting justice of the New York State Supreme Court. In 1990 and 2004, Justice Eng was elected and then re-elected to full 14-year terms on the bench. Following these terms, he was appointed administrative judge of the criminal term of the Queens County Supreme Court in 2007, and he served in that role until 2008. In 2012, Governor Cuomo appointed Justice Eng to lead the Second Department, where he became the first Asian American to serve as a presiding justice in New York State history. He has also served as an adjunct professor here at St. John University School of Law. In addition to his prolific legal career, Justice Eng proudly served his country as a member of the New York Army National Guard from 1970 until 2004, when he retired as the state judge advocate, holding the rank of colonel. Welcome, Justice Eng. <laughs> Seymour W. James Jr., an attorney with 43 years of experience, is a partner focusing on criminal defense and civil rights litigation at the law firm of Barkett, Epstein, Kieran, Alea, and Locatoro. He is the former attorney in chief of the Legal Aid Society. Prior to serving as attorney in chief, he served in the criminal defense practice as the citywide attorney in charge responsible for all trial and appellate work. Mr. James is a past president of the New York State Bar Association and the Queens County Bar Association and currently serves in the American Bar Association's House of Delegates. Mr. James is a graduate of Brown University and Boston University School of Law. Please welcome Mr. Seward Seymour W. James. And Mr. James, I turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> At this time, uh, we are going to call upon the uh, candidates for their um, uh, opening remarks. And the order uh, has been determined, and it has been determined by lot. So we will begin with uh, Mr. Nieves, please. Thank you very much. And I thank St. John's University, the Daily Eagle, 
and also the NAACP for hosting this. It's always happy and always a glad thing for me to return to my alma mater, St. John's, where I, practiced, where I studied uh, criminal justice over 20 years ago. My name is Jose Nieves, and I'm running for Queens County District Attorney. I've been a progressive prosecutor for over 18 years, having served with the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, the New York State Attorney General's Office, the U.S. Attorney General's Office for the Northern District of New York, and the U.S. Army as a military prosecutor. I'm a proud Army combat veteran who served our country over 10 years and one year in Afghanistan, but I've been a community leader for over 25 years. I've been living in Southeast Queens with my family, my beautiful wife Vivian, and my two kids, but I didn't grow up in, uh, in Queens. I grew up in East New York, Brooklyn. During the 1980s and 90s, during the height of the crack epidemic, where I saw violent crime. So I personally know why public safety is so important. On the other hand, as a man of color, as a Latino, I've seen the discrimination in our criminal justice system because I've been stopped by the police for no other reason than because of the way I look. That is why for the last few years, I've dedicated my career to holding the system accountable by prosecuting and investigating police officers and correctional officers who abuse their authority. And I prosecuted the first homicide case against a police officer who shot a man in front of his family who was unarmed at the time and under the new executive order of the New York State Governor. I have the life experience to change the criminal justice system, but I also have the professional experience to make those changes happen. Right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next candidate will be uh, Ms. Caban. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Tiffany Caban. I was born in South Richmond Hill, Queens. My parents grew up in the Woodside Housing Projects, and certainly who I am and what I fight for have been shaped by my experiences in over-policed, over-criminalized, resource-starved communities. I've spent my career as a public defender, representing over a thousand clients who couldn't afford to defend themselves, who found themselves on Rikers Island simply because they could not pay bail, they jumped a turnstile, they struggled with mental health or substance use disorder, yet if you were wealthy, if you had the right political ties, you could get away with harming our communities. And every day in court affirmed that our justice system is the most powerful driver of the continued oppression and marginalization of our black and brown, our low income, our LGBTQIA plus and immigrant communities. Right now, our DA's offices have sold us a false promise of safety, a culture of convictions at all costs that has not kept us safe. And what we need are public defenders metrics for success, a commitment to reduce recidivism, to decarcerate our city and keep people rooted in their communities with access to services and supports because our communities know that stability equals public safety, and to simply apply the law fairly across racial and class lines. We talk about progressive prosecution and these reforms. They are things that public defenders have always known, have fought for on the front lines, on, in courts, and up in Albany for decades. This is a continuation of the work that I have always done. What I represent certainly is a clean break from the status quo, I'm done. and uh, I hope to earn your support tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Malik. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. My name is Mina Malik. I'm running for Queens District Attorney based on three main reasons. Number one, my lived experience as a woman, a person of color, an immigrant growing up in Queens and having raised two black sons in Queens. My family has been a lifetime of service-oriented people. My husband is the chair of Johnny Cochran's law firm in Manhattan who fights for civil rights every single day. And I have spent over 20 years in the criminal justice space, not only on the prosecution side, but also on the defense side. I started off my career at the DC Public Defender Service, worked at the Queens DA's office where I worked on special victims cases, child homicides, child physical sexual abuse, adult sex crimes, human trafficking, and crimes against our senior citizens. I was special counsel to Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson where we created a gold standard of a conviction review unit which has exonerated and freed 26 wrongfully convicted people to date, as well as decriminalized a marijuana possession, low-level marijuana possession policy. We've done all of these reforms. I was also Deputy Attorney General for Attorney General Carl Racine, where I implemented criminal justice reforms that all of the candidates here are talking about today. And finally, I'm the only candidate who has served as executive director and the leader of a citywide agency, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and implemented reforms there. I managed a $16.5 million budget, as well as 200 employees, and that is a very practical experience that needs to be considered in this race. When we're talking about running an agency of 600 employees, 300 prosecutors, and 300 union workers. Thank you. Ms. Katz. Thank you to everyone for hosting this tonight. 
Um, my name is Melinda Katz. I am an attorney for 30 years in private practice and in public service. At every stage of my public service, I have fought for justice. In the New York State Assembly, I was a sponsor and I fought for a bill to give child victims of sexual abuse justice to make sure that their abusers were held accountable for their actions. As the Queensborough President, I work every single day in this borough for, with care violence groups and with people that have dedicated their lives to making sure that young people never pick up a gun. I wake up every morning running a multi-million dollar agency with a borough-wide office being held accountable to every constituent in this borough day in and day out. I make sure that we have a voice for immigrants, for women, and for anyone else in this borough that feels like they don't have a voice. As the district attorney, I run with a history of fighting for justice for 25 years. I will end cash bail. I will create bureaus to protect workers, to protect tenants, to protect immigrants. We have a chance to make real criminal justice reform here in the borough of Queens. But it is too important a job to leave it to someone who has to introduce themselves to the community on day one of this job. It is also too important a job to leave it to someone who doesn't have the skill set or the experience to make real changes in such a mass office like the Queens District Attorney's Office. If we don't get it right this time, it will have criminal justice reform indications and ramifications throughout this entire country. Thank you for having us at my alma mater of St. John's. Right, thank you. Um, Mr. Lassman. Lassman. Lassman, yes. Lassman. Good. Lassman, yes. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the 24th Council District, and welcome to my honorary alma mater. I did ROTC here, and I was an adjunct professor at the law school. I'm running for district attorney because our criminal justice system is racist, it discriminates against poor people, and it does not protect working people, women, immigrants, homeowners, or tenants. That's why in the city council, where I chair the committee that oversees the district attorneys, through the bills that I've passed, the hearings that I've held, the funding that I've appropriated, we have directly attacked over-policing and mass incarceration, the evils of cash bail, the criminalization of mental illness, addiction, and poverty, wrongful convictions, police misconduct, and the abuse of women. This is all very personal for me. I grew up in Flushing with my mom in our little rent-regulated apartment. I know what it's like for the landlord to harass you out of the apartment because he wants to turn it into a luxury co-op. My wife came to this country as an immigrant, a political <coughs> refugee, when she was 10 years old. If she came today, Donald Trump would put her in a cage. I know what it means to be powerless. And as a lawyer for 19 years, I represented powerless people, women who were sexually harassed, people who were discriminated against on the job, cheated out of their wages, or injured, in some cases killed in the workplace because their employer did not care about their safety. I have walked the walk, talked the talk, and there's not a criminal justice reform that we're going to talk about this evening that I don't have a substantial body of accomplishment as a public official and as a lawyer. I'm, I'm running to radically transform the criminal justice system here in Queens, and I hope you give me that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Laysack. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. I'm Gregory Laysack, and I'm running for district attorney. Having been reelected to the Supreme Court, I resigned my judgeship after nine months because this is too important a job. I agree with Ms. Katz. It's too important a job to have somebody get this job that has no experience in this field. No experience in this field. I was a DA for 25 years. As you know, the Daily News endorsed me in the beginning of their editorial page. They defined what a district attorney is. And they said, that sounds like a job for a prosecutor. And they said I had unmatched experience. I gave a voice to victims. No one here talks about victims. I gave a voice to victims for 25 years, such as Laura Ann Evelyn, who was brutally raped and thrown off the roof of Rochdale Village. Police officer John Scarangella, who was murdered in a hail of bullets, and his partner was wounded eight times. And I gave a voice to Mark Davidson, a 17-year-old young man of color, a college student, who was arrested for marijuana and tortured by the police officers in the 106th Precinct. And I conducted the stun gun investigation. I intend to come back into the office, hire the right kind of ADAs, set the right kind of tone. I want to diversify the office. 
I'm going to divide the gang unit from the hate crimes unit because Anger. they're two different mm -hmm. units. And I'm going to go back there and set the right tone in terms of freeing wrong men or innocent. All right, thank you. And I have the first question, and the question will be posed to all six candidates now on the stage. And I want to preface the question by saying this. The Queen's District Attorney's Office, of course, is a law office, and a very large office at that. Some 335 assistant district attorneys, I believe. And of course, supervising uh, attorneys and managing attorneys is an art in and of itself. And I'm going to ask uh, each candidate what experience do they have in supervising a large office of lawyers and their legal work. We'll start with Ms. Mallet. Yes, so the Queens District Attorney's Office is the largest legal office and law office in this county of 2.4 million people. My experience already spans three government agencies in terms of managing and leading government agencies. As special counsel to Brooklyn DA Ken Thompson, we had 1,200 employees in the Brooklyn DA's office, and it is one of the largest prosecutorial agencies in the country. I helped him manage the day-to-day -day operations there for all 1,200 employees. As the executive director of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, I had 200 employees under my stead, as well as a $16.5 million budget. So I implemented culture change and reform there, more in-depth investigations, proactive prosecutions, as well as more community outreach, and a data transparency initiative, which was the first ever for any police oversight agency in the country. And finally, as Deputy Attorney General, I was in charge of 110 employees dealing with the criminal section, juvenile justice, as well as restorative justice, victim services, mental health, domestic violence, special projects, and litigation, where I was Deputy Attorney General to Attorney General Carl Racine in an office of 600 employees. Mm -hmm. Experience matters, and we need, Queens deserves, a person who has led and managed before. All right, thank you, Ms. Malik. Uh, same question to Ms. Caban. Yes. As a public defender um, for the past seven years, at any given time I have represented anywhere from 60 to 80 clients managing teams, dozens of teams consisting of immigration attorneys, social workers, investigators, community-based organizations, medical professionals managing relationships with, with judges, with district attorneys. But beyond that, we're talking about what skills are necessary to bring into that office to be successful, what transferable skills. And that's shown through my demonstrated ability to build powerful coalitions around my vision, around my policies. You know, this campaign started literally with four women sitting at a table saying that we were going to change the system. And in six months, with almost no resources, we have built the most powerful coalition in this race. We have a full team of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers, but beyond that, have garnered the support of not just Queens residents, but citywide and even nationwide, having the leading criminal justice reformers rallying around the country rallying behind us. What we have done is built something very powerful no, on no, a however, but, budget. But excuse me, uh, but actual sure. supervisory experience over the work product of lawyers? Sure, and again, I'm going to zoom out, right? Because this is about transferable skills. When we talk about being, listen, a 31-year-old queer Latina from a working class family, there are so many times where people will tell you, you are too young, you are too inexperienced, you don't have the right kind of experience. But again, when we talk about how we got here and what we have built, it shows that I can manage a very large team as the candidate in a race, which I think, by the way, is sort of like being a CEO of a company where you have your COO as your campaign manager, where you are managing different divisions, whether it's communications, field operations, budgets and finance, it's a, a very large moving operation and those are transferable skills that I plan to bring to the office besides also having seven years of experience as a public defender representing over a thousand right. clients from charges ranging right, from thank you. Thank you. to homicides. So I'm going to pose the same question to Mr. Nunes. Thank you, Judge. I have extensive experience. All the 18 years of experience I have practicing I have been a manager and a supervisor of attorneys, uh, prosecutors specifically at the New York State or at the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office where I supervised and I managed district attorneys, assistant district attorneys in the practice of misdemeanor and felony cases. I also was the 
uh, Deputy Chief of the New York State Attorney General's Special Investigations and Prosecutions Unit. This was a statewide unit charged by the governor to investigate and, and prosecute any uh, incidents where law enforcement caused the death of unarmed civilians. And I had to supervise other assistant attorney generals, other investigators, a team of investigators, a team of attorney, assistant attorney generals in the investigation of police involved homicides, not only in Queens, not only in Brooklyn, but statewide. So my cases range from Buffalo to Long Island. And I think that, you know, that's the type of experience you need. As a judge advocate, I was a command judge advocate with the New York States Army. I supervised the criminal law division of the Fort Drum um, St. Uh, Staff Judge Advocate Office, where I managed other judge advocates, other pros military prosecutors, and I handled a multi-million dollar budget, which included correctional facility services, court services, and other uh, you know, infrastructure expenditures for the criminal law division. So I have extensive uh, experience in supervising. When I served in Afghanistan, I was the command judge advocate for the eastern provinces of Afghanistan, where I, where I oversaw the reconstruction of the criminal justice system in eastern Afghanistan, where I oversaw not only the reconstruction and the, the build-up build of correctional facilities, but also courthouses, also uh, cor um, a police and, and border patrol. And I was supervising not only U.S. personnel, but also Afghan personnel. I'm being an advisor to Afghan judges, Afghan lawyers, defense counsels, and prosecutors. So I have extensive experience supervising and managing legal professionals. Right, thank you very much. And uh, uh, Mr. Lasak, the same question to you, sir. Right. After having worked my way up the ranks in the DA's office, started trying murder cases, I was appointed the chief of the Homicide Bureau in 1984. And remained the chief of the Homicide Bureau. During that time, there were 10 to 14 attorneys working in that bureau determined, determined by the caseload. Judge Brown came in in 1991. He made me an executive assistant. At first, we put together the Case Management Bureau, Case Management Division, which had approximately 100 attorneys in it. I was in charge of that until we formed the Major Crimes Division later that year, and I was put in charge of that. There was about 65 lawyers working at the Major Crimes Division, which encompassed the Homicide Trial Bureau, the Homicide Investigation Bureau, the Special Victims Bureau, and the Career Criminal Major Case Bureau, which DA had me form when he first came in. From the Special Victims Bureau in the 90s, I created the Domestic Violence Bureau because of the prevalence of those type of crimes and we needed an entire bureau dedicated to that. So that's the experience I have had with attorneys, and I resigned as the deputy administrative judge. I was the deputy administrative judge since 2015, and being in charge of judges is a lot harder than being in charge of lawyers. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And Ms. Katz, the same question, please. So, um, look, I'm not a career prosecutor, um, and I have been a shareholder at a major law firm. I have run a 65-person office with a multi-million dollar budget with borough-wide reach. I have 14 community boards that I'm responsible for their fiscal budget, and I oversee their, some of their contracts. I appoint 700 community board members, and every single day, I manage an answer to 2.34 million people in this great borough of Queens. But I'm putting that aside as managerial experience, including the 30 years as a lawyer and all that comes with it. I believe a good district attorney in an office that needs so much reform and so much change has to have a history with the people of the borough of Queens in answering every single day to them. I think a good district attorney needs to have good moral judgment. I think a good one has to have uh, the ability to diversify the office like I did with the borough president's office. I believe you have to have a history of fighting for justice and more than anything else, more than anything else, you have to have the faith and the trust of the people of Queens County, and you know how to make this right. We have the only opportunity we've had in almost 30 years to get criminal justice reform correctly. And let me tell you, you want criminal justice reform throughout the United States of America? We want to make sure that our, our borough is followed in the criminal justice reform uh, movement that's happening right now. You had better get it right the first time. But if you have to learn the managerial experience on day one, if you have to introduce yourself to the community groups, like the Cure Violence groups that I work with every single day, if you have to introduce yourself to the mental health clinics and all the community board members in this great borough of Queens, then you cannot do 
do this job on January 1st, 2020. Good, thank you. And Mr. Lansing, please. So my legal experience and my supervisory experience are threefold. First, as I said in my opening statement, I practiced law for about 19 years. For much of that time, I was handling complex litigation in state and federal court and before regulatory agencies, and very often was supervising junior attorneys in those matters. And from time to time, we're supervising more senior attorneys who did not have the expertise in those areas of law. This would be an employment litigation, mass tort litigation. Um, these are complex matters against uh, well-funded and very capable adversaries. As a council member and as an assembly member, I oversee the lawyers who work on the legislation uh, that I'm involved with, and as chair of the committee on the justice system in the city council, I oversee not only my own legislative council, but the council um, who work on the committee that, I'm, that I chair, and to a certain extent, the committees who, the councils who work on the committees that I serve when I'm engaged in uh, legislation in relation to, to their work. As you might know, I uh, have a prolific history of passing legislation both in the city and in the state, so that involves a lot of intense, close supervision with very experienced and knowledgeable lawyers trying to move uh, legislation forward through the amendment, hearing, negotiation, uh, and execution process, most of which, certainly in the last five and a half years, relate to uh, criminal justice reform issues. And then lastly, as chair of the committee, I oversee the five district attorneys and the special narcotics prosecutor, and much of my time is spent overseeing, in a manner of speaking, the work that they do, the way that they perform their duties, the outcomes that they produce, and their enactment of legislative and, and, and policy reforms that we have pushed them to adopt. Thank you. My, my first question will go to Ms. Katz. Uh, the Queens District Attorney's Office is widely viewed as one of the most punitive DA's offices in the city. What steps would you take to change the culture of the office? And would that include changing the executive staff? I've already said in very many public forums that I would diversify the staff, I would change the executive staff, I would look to see what, what uh, type of attorneys are inside the office to try and promote, but I would also change the executive staff. And I think they would probably want to move on to other things. We have a very different policy in the Katz administration than in the Brown administration. Um, you know, I have a history of working with a lot of the groups to make sure that people don't end up in the criminal justice system, and I think that is so important. But you asked what I would do. So the first thing I would do is diversify this office from the top down, bottom up. I think that involves a lot of things. That involves not only reflecting the diversity of this great borough, but it also talks and should be about hiring from within the community. As the borough president, I know every single neighborhood in this borough. I know that our culture is different when you cross the street in any part of our borough. So we need to hire from the community as well as diversifying the office. Second, we would have a conviction integrity unit that would be made up of a different ADA that prosecuted the case. It would be made up of a uh, criminal defense bar. It would also have any of these groups like the Innocence Project or Vera that wants to join in. But it would also have people from the community as well who know the cultures of each neighborhood and we would work with them every single time on every single conviction integrity case. We also need to make sure that all of the laws that have just been passed would be effectuated equally and well throughout the office, but I would go further and I would say no cash bail. No cash bail. We need to make sure that in this office we have no cash bail. And I say that several times because it's been questioned and I think it should be clear on the record. Last but not least, although at least in my 90 seconds, um, I think that we need to have a, a checkpoint to make sure that my policies are being followed by the district attorneys, and this is where experience matters. My name has been on the door of the Queensboro President's Office and as a legislator in the Assembly and the Council for 25 years. I know how to make people answer for what my policies are going to be. So if we're going to have, for instance, plea bargaining at the bottom count as the regular course of business, then they need to make sure that they answer to me when there's any other extraordinary circumstances that makes them think that that's not the right thing. If we're gonna have no cash bail, I wanna know what they're doing as far as supervised release if that comes into play, or any of the diversion programs if that comes into play, but mostly what kind of drug rehab services, what mental health clinic services, workforce development services, and cure violence groups that we are using. And I do think 
then making the district attorney's office less punitive. This is exactly where you need to know the community leaders, the civic leaders, the care violence groups, the mental health services. It is the reason that people like Nicole Bell have come on board in my campaign, because she knows that I will make this a more fair and equitable <coughs> office, and that I will make up for the past wrongs that have been done in that office. But experience does matter in the community, and this is a really key example of why. I'd like to ask the same question of uh, Ms. Malik. So it is extremely important that there is change in the Queens DA's office. And just like in any presidential administration, once a new president comes in, the entire cabinet changes. But when you're trying to implement culture change in an office that has operated a certain way for 20 years, it's extremely important to have, number one, street credibility. You have to have credibility with the defense bar, the judiciary, the NYPD, the public, and the people in the office itself. If you don't have the street credibility of having practiced in, a, in the criminal justice space for over 20 years, then you're gonna be in trouble. And in order to implement culture change, sometimes the most pushback that you get when you're trying to imp implement transformational change in an organization is from within. So the entire executive staff would have to go and what we did at the Brooklyn DA's office, what I did at the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and what I did at the Attorney General's office, is you look within, see who you can promote from within, who's for the new policies, for the new vision of the agency, and who will help you implement those new policies and that new vision. You also want to make sure that you're hiring at the rank and file level to make sure that the people that you bring on board are in keeping with the vision and the mission of the agency. And that's what's very important and critical here is that I have the practical experience to make sure that gets done to implement culture change. At the end of the day, the wheels of justice don't stop in criminal justice. People are still going to get arrested. People are still going to need bail. People are still going to have to face charges in the criminal justice system and we need to keep our community safe. So implementing that culture change coupled with making sure that our communities are safe while implementing criminal justice reform is a very, very delicate balancing act. And Queens deserves the right person to make sure that the scales of justice are balanced. Mr. Lisa? One of the first things I would change would be the plea policy. Right now, there's a policy in place that if you don't take a plea pre-indictment, you have to plea to the top count after indictment. I don't agree with that because things change, facts change, witnesses uh, have problems or say things differently. Cases change. So just because there's an indictment doesn't mean that I'm going to make the defendant plead guilty to the top charge. I'm going to change that right away. I also want to diversify the office to reflect our most diverse county. I want to separate the gang unit from the hate crimes unit, it's called the anti-bias unit, because those two bureaus take a different set of skills and they shouldn't be lumped together. And we have a gang problem in Queens, so I would beef up that unit. I also wanna hire 18 community assistant DAs, one from each of the assembly districts. And that person, that assistant DA, will have a relationship with the local police department, the local precincts in that assembly district, they'll have a relationship with the community leaders, the political leaders, the civic leaders in that area. And if there's any problems, they will come back to the office and tell us about it so we can prevent them, prevent them from happening in the first place, or if they start to gather steam, we can bring the whole leadership of that particular assembly district into the DA's conference room and put that to rest. Also. I'm gonna start a conviction integrity unit. I was doing that work in the 1990s, early 2000s, before anyone ever heard of a conviction integrity unit, before anyone ever thought of a in conviction integrity unit. Those are the toughest cases I worked on because when you work on those cases, you have to go against the decision of the detective who arrested the person, the ADA who wrote up the case, the grand jury who indicted the person, and the jury, the pettit jury that convicted him, 
and the appellate court that ruled it was a just conviction. You have to go against the decisions of all of those people, and that's not easy to do. I'm gonna start a conviction integrity unit, put the right kind of people in there that have the right mindset. And finally, this office handles 50,000 cases a year. As the district attorney, I could not approve any diversion from a set plea on the, that amount of cases. I'd be doing that all day long. That's why we need a prosecutor with experience to take this job, not a politician who has no idea what it takes in the day-to-day -day operation of a DA's office. Okay, before the next question, I just do want to recognize we've been joined in progress by candidate Lugo. Welcome. Continue. Um, so I'm, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Now I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Mr. Lance. Uh, a number of lawsuits and appellate decisions reveal a pattern of prosecutorial misconduct in the Queens DA's office. Included in the misconduct is withholding information favorable to the defense. What will you do to correct these practices, and what actions will you take to hold accountable assistants who violate the rules? Excellent question. It takes the um, abstract idea that this is a punitive office that is damaging the lives of thousands of people every year and, and brings it to a real level. In, in the last couple of decades, there have been over 100 reversals of convictions coming out of Queens where uh, the court has specifically cited some form of prosecutorial misconduct. And it starts, fixing the problem starts with the last question, how do you change the culture in the office? Well, it starts by electing a district attorney who best represents the break from that culture. For the last four and a half years, five and a half years that I've been a city council member, in particular, I have been the candidate up here who's consistently been pushing the Queens District Attorney's Office and other district attorney's office to reform their practices, reform their discovery practices, reforming their plea bargaining practices, reform their practices as it comes to wrongful convictions, reform their practices as it comes to um, uh, alternative to uh, detention and sentencing programs. This office needs a district attorney who is the embodiment of reform, not merely in their expressions or their opinions or where they'd like to be once they become the DA, but represents that, um, uh, that mandate. Specifically, in the district attorney's office, we are going to undo all of the policies that have produced so many wrongful convictions, that have produced so many uh, convictions that have been overturned. We're gonna end the abuse of discovery rules. Even with the new reforms that are coming into place, there is still room for prosecutors to play games with not turning over Brady material, with not being forthright about um, uh, Giglio issues. Even with the new reforms coming into place, there is still room for prosecutors to play games with the speedy trial rules, which have the result of forcing defendants to uh, choose whether they want to stay on Rikers Island or plead guilty to something that they haven't done just so they can go home to their family. We're gonna have in our office a code of ethics, which I wrote about in the New York Law Journal, that is unique. All of us as lawyers operate under a broad code of ethics, but there is no specific code of ethics for prosecutors despite the extraordinary public responsibilities that they have. My office will have such a code of ethics and it will be enforced by an independent integrity officer. I can go on and on about all the shortcomings of the Queens DA's office, but let me just reiterate. You wanna change the culture of the Queens DA's office, you wanna change the culture of wrongful convictions, of convictions that are obtained um, um, illegally and unlawfully, you elect a reform-minded district attorney who has a record of making reforms in district attorney's offices. All right, we're gonna pause the proceedings for a moment and move to our first set of lightning round questions. And before we do that, I'm just gonna ask my colleague, Diane, if she can come down and we're still collecting questions from the audience. Uh, if you have questions, put them on the index cards and Diane will get them and, and get them up to me. Um, lightning round, yes, no, short answer, please. I'm gonna make it easy, we're gonna go down the line and then we're gonna work our way back. Are you ready? Ms. Caban, we're gonna start with you and work our way down and back. You said this is lightning round yesterday. Lightning round, yes, no, short answer. Okay. Did you pass the New York State Bar Exam on your first attempt? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. 
Yes, I do. I was actually expecting my first child and had to take it a second time. Yes, I did. Very good. If you were back in law school and forming a study group, what opponent from this race would you want in your study group, and what opponent could you live without in the study group? We're going to start down there, and we're going to work our way back. It's a study group. I would take uh, Judge Lasak. Um, I would do it out, uh, Miss Cass. Miss mm -hmm. Mount. I would take Jose Nieves, and I would do without Miss Cass. Miss Lugo. I would take uh, Judge Lasak, and I would do without Tiffany Kaban. I would take Mr. Lansman and do without Miss Cass. I was going to say I wanted Jose Nieves, but now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, would, I would like to actually uh, share uh, our notes with uh, Mr. Nieves, uh, and I don't think we need uh, Mr. Lasak at the table. I'll change my answer. Miss <laughs> Come on. Uh, uh, Tiffany. Oh, you oh, Tiffany, I dodged it. Leave me alone. Oh. <laughs> I would I, I think I would like to uh, my uh, my Chavusa, as we say in uh, in in UP, I, I I would I would study with Ms. Malik. Um, I I don't want to be mean. I I, I I don't want to be mean. I'm not gonna answer that. Ah. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I will compare and contrast my record as much as Anybody wants right. but we'll it's a mean on. question and I don't like it. I'm sorry. Ms. Kaban. Uh, I'd be happy to study with Mr. Lansman. Thank you. Anyone you can do it now? No, you can leave it at that. Leave it at that. Ms. Kaban, we'll start again with you. Texting or talking, which do you prefer? Depends on the person. <laughs> <laughs> Melinda. I talk. I like to talk. I'm a talker, especially with my hands. I prefer talking. Talking, I prefer human content. I prefer social interaction, talking. I prefer talking. Mr. Nieves, how would you describe yourself? Spiritual, religious, or both? Both. Both. Both, especially for St. Anthony's feast day today. Both. <laughs> Spiritual. I would say both, but I would describe myself as a lot of other things too, but spiritual and religious. Spiritual. Last one for this round. Cardi B or Nicki Minaj? Cardi. Queens, Nikki. Yeah. Both. <laughs> well, he said he was spiritual and religious. J Lo. Both. Cardi. Back to the real questions. Okay, uh, Ms. Kabar. Uh, gun violence has been reduced significantly in the last decade, but continues to be a problem in Queens. What will you do to reduce the incidence of gun violence? Well, again, when we look at the role of, of the district attorney's office um, and kind of shift away from this idea that we punish for the sake of punishing, but that what we should do is try to achieve public safety, it makes all the sense in the world to be taking more preventative measures to interrupt violence before it escalates. But before I go into that plan, I just also want to point out that up to this point in our Queens DA's office, there have been disparities in how these laws are, are implemented and prosecuted um, within communities. You know, literally in Queens, they have this thing called the good guy packet, where if you are, say, a, a white person traveling in, a, in an airport with a firearm, um, the defense attorney hands over this good guy packet, a pre-pleading uh, memorandum, and they get the benefit of, of getting a better deal. But if you are black and brown and live in our, our Queens community, you are precluded from getting any sort of deal that doesn't involve upstate prison time. That's a problem. Um, but beyond that, again, when we talk about taking preventative measures, it's about working with groups like Cure Violence, saying that when we go into communities, ask communities how we can best interrupt violence before it escalates, help them get credible messengers in place, uh, gun violence goes down by upwards of, 
of 30 to 40 percent in ways that our, our police officers haven't been able to do, in ways that our district attorney's office haven't do, been able to do. So it's really about centering community solutions because our communities know best in so many situations. Ms. Lugo, same question. I, um, one of my clients is uh, Fernando Mateo, who um, started Toys for Guns in New York uh, City. And that brought the um, awareness of guns to the community. We need to do something like that again, and we need to do it in Queens. However, I believe that the enforcement of uh, gun possession in Queens is a little strong. I'm working on a vacature motion of a, a conviction for gun possession. <coughs> Uh, for a former Marine, so we can get his, um, his a certificate of relief of disabilities and be able to vote. But on the other hand, as a prosecutor in Nassau County, I've also seen corrections officers who have a loaded gun and then one of the children get it and shoot somebody. So it is a big problem. We have to educate uh, the community about, the, um, about both sides of, of guns and we have to work together with faith-based communities and community-based groups on how to properly handle guns if you have one, if you're not licensed to have one, how to get the proper license if you really need one, and um, just to bring education and awareness to the community. The people that shouldn't have guns and are using them to terrorize or whatever, listen, they're coming from other states. They're not all from Queens. So we do need to do something about it, and the best way is I'm going to have a 24-hour hotline. And if you know want someone who has an unlicensed gun, you call that 24-hour hotline, it will be anonymous, and we will take action to investigate, properly investigate, and do what is proper and necessary to stop the, uh, the gun violence and the gun possession, illegal gun possession. Thank you. You know, this is where experience matters, and this is where experience trumps political rhetoric. rhetoric. We need to be serious about reducing gun violence and reducing violence, uh, all violence in Queens. And what I would do, I would invest the funds, the funds that we have at the DA's office, forfeiture funds, in the reduction of gun, uh, not only gun violence, but all violence. I will have uh, individual uh, programs apply for funds, such as the Cure, um, you know, Cure Violence Program, the 696 Build in Queensbridge, also the Fathers Alive in the Hood uh, organization, and organizations that reduce violence all together in our community. And I believe that's how we're gonna reduce violence. But we also have to do long-term investigations and bring to justice those gun runners that are flooding our streets with guns. And that's where the experience comes in. Because the district, the district attorney has to know when to use these tools in his, in his, his arsenal, such as when to you cover a, a confidential informant, when to utilize a confidential informant, when to go up on a wire in a long-term investigation. I've done these long-term investigations. And I've taken down large-scale uh, operations and cartels and the third in command of the Latin Kings. So I know how to run these operations and I know how to supervise other attorneys in reducing crime by engaging these long-term operations that reduce the running, the, the, the transport and the smuggling and the sale of firearms in our, in our streets. All right, my turn. Now, I uh, experienced four transitions of district attorney administrations in my eight plus years in the Queens District Attorney's Office. It's a, uh, it's a tricky business. Now, my question for each of you, which I'm gonna call upon you individually is, what plan do you have now to implement a transition so that when you open the store, so to speak, on January 2nd, 2020, you have confidence in who is um, acting in your name. What will be your approach to this? Mr. Lansman. Thank you. So fortunately, we have a model for transition because we've had some turnover in district attorneys in the last few years, um, whether it was Ken Thompson taking over from Charles Hines or Eric Gonzalez taking over from Ken Thompson after his untimely passing. Um, and fortunately, because of the work that I've done both as a lawyer and as a policymaker, I have a wide range, range of relationships with the leaders of the bench, the bar, the criminal justice reform world, my friends that, who are the leaders of the public defender organizations, civil legal services providers who I think are uh, potentially an undervalued resource in helping to build up the office, as well as the relationships I have with the various bar associations throughout the, the city, not just the city bar association, the Queens County Bar Association, 
but the Macon B. Allen Bar Association, the Brandeis Bar Association. And so um, on June 25th, hopefully the people, or at least the Democratic voters will give me the nomination. On June 26th, I am prepared mm -hmm. to announce a transition committee. I know who the co-chairs are. I know or have a good idea of who the chairs of the major committees are related to, to policy and, and to personnel. And I'm very confident based on having been deeply involved in um, the process of criminal justice reform in New York City uh, for the last number of years that we're going to fill out that committee and from June 26th to January 1st, uh, we will be ready. All right, thank you. Ms. Katz. So uh, when I won the borough president's race, we actually sat down with every single employee that was not a civil servant, and I re-interviewed every single one of them. And I think that's extremely important in the transition. So we would start on June 26th with a transition team. I would caucus with Eric Gonzalez if he would caucus with me. I would have a transition team that is filled with the groups from the communities, with former ADAs, with judges, and to make, with former judges, and to make sure that we pick the right people to run the bureaus. I would also meet with the people that are at the DA's office right now, even those transitioning out, to get opinions and to seek you know, some sort of uh, stabilization in the transition when it comes towards January 1st. But I do think that what's truly important in the transition team is to have people that share your views, share your policies, and have a system set up so that you are making sure and checking them every single day. I'll give you an example, gun violence. You know, we work every single day at Greensboro Hall with a lot of the cure violence groups. And it's a reason that many of the heads of the groups have endorsed my candidacy because they know that they can trust my work. People like that, people like the Furtado, people like Ford, people in the, in the community like the Cobell, they should also be part of a transition team because we need community liaisons so that the office knows what is going on in the communities and how we can respond to it. But it is an area, when you're talking about transitioning a borough-wide office, that you do need to know the names of the leaders of the community, the organizations that you can trust, the not-for-profits that you can work on, but you also need to have the ability and the skill set to pick the expertise that is in front of you from the other boroughs. It is the reason, for instance, that I would stay in Dabney, because I would be the only district attorney that is not part of a statewide group to be sharing views and to be able to bring views that are good all around the state back to the borough of Queens. So I've done a transition. I interviewed everyone on my own. I made sure I will make sure that we have a lot of the community groups as well as expertise sitting on the transition team. All right, thank you. Transitions, Ms. Mallory. Yes, so having done this in three prior agencies, I'm very familiar with how we should do transitions. And it's extremely important, number one, to make sure we have listening sessions with the members who are in the Queens District Attorney's Office already. Because a lot of times, the people who are on the ground and doing the day-to-day -day work and the front lines have great ideas as to how to make the agency better. And that's something that sometimes people, people's wishes fall on deaf ears. So it's extremely important to bring in the people who are already in the agency doing the day-to-day -day work and listening to them and hearing what they think needs to be changed. In terms of a transition team, I have the benefit of being endorsed by the three former heads of the DC Public Defender Service who are nationally renowned leaders in criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Carter Stewart and Steve Delbach, the US attorneys for the Northern and Southern District of Ohio, who are also into criminal justice reform, and a number of other criminal justice reformers who are nationally renowned. I would look to them, I would work with Fair and Just Prosecution, Miriam Krinsky's group, as well as the, the Justice Collaborative, and make sure that we put together a meaningful transition team who can help me bring on people who will implement the new vision, the 21st century modern day prosecutor's vision for Queens County. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kabayan, transition? Yes, my transition team already includes former prosecutors, defenders, formerly incarcerated folks, criminal justice reform adv uh, advocates from around the country, as well as educational and mental health uh, professionals and former law enforcement members who will be working very closely with a community steering uh, committee that will be developed within the office. In terms of transitioning and helping the staff come along, for the folks who do stay uh, and want to get on board with these changes, we will be working with Prosecutor Impact, Fair and Just Prosecution, as well as the Justice Collaborative, so that we can help folks along and re 
train on trauma-informed practices, restorative justice, and alternatives to incarceration. It starts with coming in with a very clear memo of what all the policies are, so that the DAs on the ground know um, what they're going to be working with and for. And then beyond that, making it very clear what their measures are in terms of uh, the job that they will be doing, so there's no mistake about that. And making it very clear that we're gonna support people with these changes through these trainings as long as they have a commitment to doing the decarceral, restorative justice, rehabilitative work. Um, you know, one of the, the other things that, that that results in is again, sort of getting buy-in incredible messengers in place that we are empowering uh, and uh, applauding district attorneys for the work that we're doing um, and continuing in that transition. All right, thank you. And Mr. Laysack, transition. January 1st, the stroke of midnight, a new district attorney takes over. And he or she is responsible for everything from that minute on. The first thing I would do was set up a meeting in the morning, find out how many wiretaps are there in this county that we're working on, because those are sensitive investigations. Then I would appoint a point, a point person to keep advised as to what is going on from that stroke of midnight on afterwards, because that would be our watch. The hotline that they have set up, sometimes it's a little faulty. The hotline is where the PD and other law enforcement agencies call in and tell us about incidents that are a note, like a homicide or a shooting or significant things like that. I want to make sure that there's no breakdown in that notification because that could cause a big problem if we're not notified immediately. I started that notification system in 1984. When I became chief of homicide, we didn't know about a homicide until the next day or two days later when they handed us a uh, sheet of paper. I think there was a detective, Joe, not sure his name, Detective Egan, who came in with the sheet. I made it a policy that the PD had to notify us in the line of notifications, just like when they call crime scene and the medical examiner's office they have to call the DA's office. So that started in 84, Judge Brown came in in 91, and he liked that, and he went to a lot of, a lot of the crime scenes. I'm also gonna appoint somebody to make sure I know the day before of any major case, break, breaking major case that's happening, or if there's a new development in a case that's been pending, if there's a trial going on on a major case, I wanna know the day before what is going on so I can be prepared. Because the DA himself or herself has to make decisions on these trial cases. Sometimes there are very sensitive issues during a trial and there's a meeting on the third floor in a conference room and the district attorney sits at the head of that table and that district attorney has to make the final decision. The DA cannot rely on an underling. And if the DA has no trial experience, I don't know how they can make decisions that serious like that. So that's what I would do in preparation for the transition. Thank you. Transition, Mr. Nieves. My, my transition team has already began. I've already uh, began uh, this having discussions with high level members of both the New York State Attorney General's office who just finished the transition uh, under the new administration and also with DA Gonzalez who I have a long term relationship with because we served at the Brooklyn DA's office together for many years. And the transition team is going to be made up of not only uh, prosecutors, but also defense counsels, also members of the advocacy groups, and individuals that, that have a, a stake in the criminal justice system, local defense bar, not only private, but also public defenders, 18B panel members. Um, and they're going to come in and they're going to help me identify my new executive staff because they, I'm going to transition out the entire executive staff for the DA's office because we need a new way of looking at things. We need a fresh set of eyes in the criminal justice system. We have to move forward with new ideas and new policies. And before we start, we have to create those policies. Those policies will be created and penned before January 1st, 2020, because before that day comes, we have to be crystal clear on the direction we're taking with the DA's office, the policies that we're, we're implementing, and, and the vision that we have. And I think that's the most important thing, is to have that transition team, have those individuals ready to move in to their offices on day one. And, and these individuals are gonna be senior, um, not only administrators, but prosecutors 
who are drawn from the U.S. Attorney's Office, Defense Bar, and also my previous office I, at the State Attorney General. I believe this combined indicated that uh, former offenders might be a part of the uh, transition team. Is that correct, Ms. Kabani? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. Do you agree with that? My, I, I will tell you this. My conviction review unit is going to have an advisory board, and the advisory board will be include formerly wrongfully convicted and exonerated individuals. So I will begin that process of identifying the members of the advisory board of my conviction review unit that will include those individuals uh, that under you know seen the injustice of our criminal justice system. However, with the executive staff, they're going to be senior um, uh, officials, both on the defense bar and on the uh, on the government side as well. All right, thank you. And Ms. Luco, same question, transition. Well, in order to do the best job for the people of Queens, the first thing that I would do is I would um, invite everyone to come to a public hearing and to get feedback from everyone on what you believe the best DA's office deserves. And, and I would include everybody from every part of Queens, from Far Rockaway, there's a lot of people who feel they're disenfranchised by the criminal justice system. They have lost trust. In order to restore that trust, not only in the DA's office, but in the criminal justice system, you must include the community. You must include the faith-based community. I've already, um, had several uh, conversations with people who are gonna serve on my transition team. I have personally served on DA Darcel Clark's transition team from the Bronx. Also DA Ken, uh, Eric Gonzalez's uh, transition team. And I served on Ken Thompson's team to diversify his office and to provide him with outreach to minority bar associations and make that connection so that there is diversity in the office. There must be diversity in the office. You have to have an office that looks like Queens. That's the only way we're gonna have that trust. We have done tremendous work in New York diversifying the judiciary. I'm the past president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association, the past president of the Hispanic National Bar Association. I'm the vice chair of the tri section for the New York State Bar Association. I work very well with people from all different backgrounds, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, legal aid attorneys, and I would bring them all together in a room to find out what's the best way to work on this office because the community, I will listen to the community and others, including past offenders, on how best to deal with the DA's office and how best to diversify Re Regarding it diversity, the which yes. you said several times already, how would you recruit a diverse um, staff of assistant district attorneys? Would you um, raid, so to speak, other offices? Would you um, uh, selectively interview candidates? How would you approach that? Well, we have, in New York, we have the network of bar leaders, which means that every bar association is represented there, from the Puerto Rican bar, the Metropolitan Black bar, the Haitian bar, the Asian bar, the Korean American bar, the women's bar, the Brandeis, the Greyhound Society, the Irish, you got the Colombian lawyers. Everyone is represented as a leader in the network of bar leaders. Everyone is going to have a transition, a, a transition worksheet on how to educate and outreach attorneys of different backgrounds on applying to law school. All the deans of all the law schools in New York and throughout the country will be invited to participate. We will have workshops on how best to learn about one, how to interview for that position. Because unfortunately, when it comes to diversity, it's how you interview in any job, and that's where we're lacking. You know, I mean, we're here at St. John's University Law School, my business partner's alma mater, and when you go out for a job, especially as an attorney, it's how you interview. It's very competitive out there. So I will have workshops for people to learn how to interview, and I encourage all bar associations to do the same, all law schools to do the same, all different community-based organizations, because we want the best people working at the DA's office. But we also want people that are compassionate, that have mercy, that believe in second and third chances. And those are the policies that I will implement as the DA's office of Queens. And people must follow my policies because it's about caring. It is going to be a community DA's office. It is gonna be the most diverse office. There will be accountability. There will be transparency. And we will make Queens a model for all other DA's offices to follow. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we're going to pause the deliberations one more time for some more lightning round questions, including questions submitted from the audience. Um, so again, lightning round, yes, no, short answer. Mr. Bond, we're going to start with you. What part, if any, of the Bill of Rights are you willing to live without? None. Okay. <clears throat> well, if you say if any, then that welcomes me to say none. Mr. Leifert. None. 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 Okay. Ms. Caban, who was your first celebrity crush? <laughs> Mila Kunis. Mr. Leifert. I have no answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lysak. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Elvis Presley. <laughs> so my husband is sitting in the audience. It's okay. It's a safe space. Ms. Caban. Uh, what is the nickname that your parents used to call you, or a nickname you had as a child? I Nothing? Yeah. Mr. Lansing. I don't have one, so Nothing. I don't Mr. Lasak. Geggy. <laughs> Lugo. Bonita, which means pretty. Yeah. Dear daughter. All right. Junior. <laughs> Mr. Nieves, Mets or Yankees? Mets. 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 Mr. Leifak. Yankees. Ooh. I'd say he does. It'd be like a, an injection that comes from the city. <laughs> Mets. You know, I, I bartended at City Field for uh, two seasons, but my grandmother was born in the Bronx, a big Bernie Williams fan, and that's where I got lo my love of baseball. So I grew up a Yankees fan. Yankees fan, okay. <laughs> Ms. Caban, what performance artist would portray you in an episode of Law and Order? <laughs> Michelle Rodriguez. Mr. Lansman. I don't watch Law and Order, so I, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're really being uncooperative. Well, it's just any actor you want to play, I'm, right? I'm sorry. Which actor would play me? Any yeah. actor. Any actor anywhere. Yeah. Any actor. Flatter player. yourself. Good. Yeah. Denzel. <laughs> Have you ever been portrayed in an episode of Law and Order more like it? Probably, uh, I forget his name, the actor that played uh, Sipowitz on NYPD. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's my friend. Mr. Lugos. I would, Mariska Hargitay. Good name. I would say Priyanka Chopra or the woman from Modern Family whose name escapes me right now. Gotcha. Jimmy Smith. Mr. Nieves, do you handle your own social media account? Yes, I do. Ms. Nauer? Sometimes. Ms. Lugo? Sometimes. No. <laughs> Mostly, yes. Um, Twitter almost exclusively. I need help with Instagram. I get a lot of help with Instagram. Uh, some questions from the audience. Would you require assistant district attorneys to reside in Queens County? Ms. Caban, let's start with you. Uh, new hires, yes. New hires? Yes. Okay. Yes, same, new hires. I would prefer that. Having worked at the Nassau County DA's office where it was a requirement, I would definitely require that people live in Queens. That's the best way to have accountability and loyalty. I would prefer it as well because people need to remain connected to the communities in Queens if they're serving our communities. I would also prefer um, a residence in Queens uh, for all new staff and current staff. Okay. Question from the audience, and again, please, yes or no or short answer. If elected district attorney, will you reopen the Chanel Lewis case for review to ensure his rights were not violated and investigate claims of prosecutorial misconduct for withholding evidence? Yes or no? Mr. Nieves. I will have that case reviewed by the conviction review unit, review unit that I create. I would have the case reviewed by the conviction review unit, yes. 
I would have the case referred to a special prosecutor for review. I can't answer that question because I sat as the judge who made decisions on that case before I left the bench. Um, that case has all the echoes of another Central Park Five, and we will be reviewing it when I become district attorney. I will also review it, yes. Okay, Ms. Kamal, we're going to start again with you. Short answer, please. Why should the family of a high level violent crime, I suppose, victim, trust you personally to prosecute the case? Why should the family of a high level violent crime trust you personally to prosecute the case? For a couple of reasons. One, certainly because of my intimate um, experiences and exposure to violence, to substance use disorder, to mental health issues, um, to domestic violence. You know, a lot of what I talk about in this race is trauma-informed practices and how we bring to the table anti-oppressive um, clinical advocacy for survivors and victims. Because up to this point, our district attorney's offices, through that culture of convictions at all costs, have really done a lot to re-traumatize um, victims and not provide supportive, supportive services to allow them to heal and get back to their lives. This is something that I care incredibly, incredibly deeply about. In fact, I used to do work with survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault who are undocumented um, in helping them adjust their status uh, under uh, VAWAs, uh, for VAWAs and, and U visas. Um, so, you know, this is advocacy that is incredibly important to me. It's also personal to me. Uh, and I, I do have a background in supporting, again, trauma-informed approaches that center the experiences of survivors Thank and victims. You. Thank you. In my own career as a lawyer, I represented women who were sexually harassed, people who were discriminated against, um, the families of people who were killed on the job. The relationship between a lawyer and, and a victim of, of corporate wrongdoing, malfeasance, is an intimate and a personal one. You live or die with your client. You suffer through every uh, up or down that they suffer with. Um, when you win the case for them or getting them a result that that is good, you, you're relieved and, and joyous, and, and when you're unable to do that, um, it is profoundly disappointing and, and, and painful. I will take that experience as a lawyer with me into the district attorney's office and treat each victim of a crime, no matter how serious uh, or perceived to be non-serious, um, as my own client. And that is a relationship, the lawyer-client relationship, particularly in the kinds of cases that I handle, it's a very intimate and personal one. Oh, I had the uh, I had the uh, it's a tough, tough thing talking to families of murder victims. I've done that hundreds of times in my career. It's the saddest thing you have to do because you cannot bring their loved one back. It's the saddest thing you have to do. And as a judge, the saddest thing. I had to do was listen to victim impact statements. Heart wrenching, heart wrenching. I had the mother of a 12 year old boy who was murdered coming home from school. Two o'clock in the afternoon, he was shot accidentally by a gang member who was shooting another gang member. 14 year old girl was sitting on a bus, city bus, going home. She was shot by a gang member. The heart wrenching things you had to hear from the parents was so sad your heart went out to them. I did that hundreds of times, both as a DA and as a Supreme Court judge. And that's why my experience would make them feel comfortable because I've been doing this my whole life. I've been doing this my whole life. One last thing, I was picking a jury on a murder case a couple of years ago and we asked the uh, prospective jurors, anyone here been a victim of a crime and it's Little woman got up and came over to the sidewalk and she says, My daughter was murdered 30 years ago. And, she, and right, we're still you were in the DA. lightning round. We're still in the yeah, short answer. Please. I'm sorry. You were the DA. It was Miss Evelyn whose daughter was murdered 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. so that, I've been doing this my whole career. Thank you. Thank you. Short answer, please. Go ahead. I've, uh, I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I'm the first Hispanic woman who worked at the Nassau County DA's office. I started my law firm 27 years ago, the first Hispanic woman known law firm in New York, Pacheco and Lugo. I am a fighter. I am a product and was raised during the Civil Rights Movement. I worked on Charlie Chisholm's presidential campaign, and I've always fought for justice in our community. Now, 
When you talk about trust, to me, the DA's office, the victim must always come first. You know, you look at the, whether there's an overcharge, et cetera, but the victim must always come first. And then you go out from there and you look at the case. The victim never understands why you're plea bargaining or why you're reducing a charge. You cannot do it without the victim's consent. I've seen that all too often because I have three clients now that are suffering the consequences of the DA deciding to let the case drop or let the case get reduced when there are serious injuries and serious crimes occurring. So we must, I am a fighter. I'm a, I'm a descendant of warriors and I'm a fighter and you can trust me to fight for the victim, but always with true justice for all, Thanks. taking into consideration the Thank justice you, of everyone. Thank, Thank you. I spent my entire life giving a voice to the voiceless and keeping our community safe. And that's how everyone knows that they can trust me to vigorously prosecute crimes, but particularly violent crimes where they need to be prosecuted. Look at my record compared to everyone else's record here. As Deputy Attorney General, making sure that our communities were kept safe from violent crime, as well as being a special victims prosecutor and a sex crimes prosecutor, keeping our women, children, and our senior citizens safe, and also holding accountable police officers when they commit misconduct. One of the, my greatest moments was trying a case in front of Justice Eng, a murder case, and he was a very difficult justice, but uh, you know, it is, <laughs> it is something that Queens can count on me to keep our community safe. And that's what you need and what Queens deserves is a prosecutor who can balance the scales of justice, having been on the defense side and the prosecution, and while making sure that our communities and our people are kept safe. They can trust me because I've dedicated my 18 year career to holding the families, the victims, and the, fa and the victims' families' hands, and doing fighting for justice, fighting for justice in every case, and that's how I—that's how I was trained as a young prosecutor. That's how I was trained in the in the military as a young prosecutor to be a minister of justice, and they can rely on me because I've done it. And this is why I'm so proud of the endorsements of Victor Dempsey and Victoria Davis. They're the brother and sister of a man who was shot and killed by a police officer in July of 2015, and I prosecuted that case. And they, they're endorsing me not because you know I, I'm a, a politician or, or I have great aspirations to do something other than to be DA, but because they know how I prosecuted that case. And they know how I sought justice for them and their families. And that's why, in the future, families can trust me. Okay, we have a couple questions that were directed to particular candidates. Again, I mean, these are pretty complex issues, but I'd ask you to try to keep your answers concise. Ms. Caban. You have the endorsement of Linda Sarsour, one of the leaders of the BDS movement. Uh, could you speak to your opinions on the uh, BDS movement as well as uh, your endorsement of Linda, the endorsement received from Linda Sarsour? Sure, I'm very proud to be endorsed by Linda Sarsour. She has been an incredible activist and advocate um, calling for the end to mass incarceration and police brutality in our communities. She has been an incredible ally in our movement for criminal justice reform. Um, when we talk about BDS speech, and as a district attorney, I will take the position uh, that we are not going to, to criminalize um, free speech, um, especially when we're talking about uh, you know, nonviolent uh, protests. We're going to protect our, our First Amendment, and we will prosecute cases where, again, you know, the speech amounts to um, inciting violence or hurting others. Thank you. Mr. Lace, I have a question for you. Uh, you are running to maintain the integrity of the office and keep our community safe. Now, Lewis was a defendant under your watch and experienced prosecutorial, prosecutorial misconduct and jury tampering. Why would, should people of color trust you? Are you allowed to comment on that? Is I can't you, comment on Chanel Lewis. Chanel Lewis, and could you explain that to the audience just real quick? Why not by Megan? The question was about Chanel Lewis, a defendant under your watch, with uh, allegations of the prosecutor, prosecutorial misconduct and jury tampering. You're not allowed to speak to it in the event of an you want to just explain that to the audience or not? Uh, prosecutorial misconduct is when a DA does something during the course of the trial that's in violation of the uh, case law. As I was sitting as a judge a few years back, one of the ADAs that worked for me in homicide did a few things during the trial in his opening statement and his closing that I took him to task for and I told him not to do it, and he kept doing it. <laughs> And he kept doing it. And the appellate division reversed it, 
based on prosecutorial misconduct wasn't anything I did, and they also wrote in there that the assistant DA defied the Supreme Court judge. When I'm DA, none of my assistant DAs will ever defy the Supreme Court judge. Okay, this question is for all of the candidates. Again, we're still in the lightning round. Short answer, yes or no's. Um, closing Rikers Island and the creation of new New York City jails. Uh, I am in support of closing Rikers Island. I am not in support of the plan of the mayor's plans to build these superstructures in our communities. Uh, again, when you build jail cells, you fill them. If we're going to have a true commitment to decarceration, we should not have facilities that hold thousands and thousands of thousands of folks. I support uh, the mayor's plan, and I have from the beginning, even before it was the mayor's plan. I support closing Rikers Island, and if you're serious about closing Rikers Island, and you're serious about criminal justice reform, you have to say where the people who will still be detained in the system will go if not on Rikers Island. And in my opinion, people who are incarcerated have a right to be close to home, close to their families, close to their lawyers, close to the courthouse. And that means putting um, a jail at the Queen's House of Detention um, in Kew Gardens, it was already smaller than was originally um, planned. This notion that we're building more jail cells than exist on Rikers Island is misleading. The jails that are proposed have far fewer beds than what is current, right, currently Rikers Island capacity. And I suggest that if you're unwilling to say where you're going to house the people who are um, still going to be detained after Rikers Island closes, if you don't have the courage to say where those people are going to be housed, then you're not serious about criminal justice reform. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Culture on Rikers Island is horrible, very violent. That must change. There's vacant land on Rikers Island. There's two vacant jails there that used to house 3,200 prisoners. If they can't be refurbished and made into state-of-the-art new prisons that are safe for the inmates and the correction officers, then they should be knocked down and rebuilt on Rikers Island. If there's vacant land there, they should start building there tomorrow on Rikers Island. There's no need to put a prison in any neighborhood in Queens County. There's no need for that. And about keeping the prisoners close to the families, yes, I agree with that. But out of the uh, cases that, uh, Queens cases, 35% of the defendants or detainees don't live in Queens. They don't come from Queens. So keeping it in Queens means 35% of the families have to come from the outer boroughs. I wouldn't agree with that. No prisons in Queens County. Stay on Rikers Island. Look up. Um, I'm in favor of closing Rikers Island, but refurbishing it and keeping it on the island. I don't believe that any new jails should be brought into the community. It is unfair, and although it's not a decision that the DA makes, it's a decision that the people make. And you have to fight it. You don't want new jails in your neighborhood. Now, I have a decarceration project, and that's the way we won't need any new jails. And my project would be to include judges and have the chief judge of the state of New York and prosecutors and defense attorneys and legal aid attorneys and the community and faith-based leaders to review every person who's at Rikers, do they belong there? Are they there because they didn't make bail? And if it's possible to vacate a conviction, then instead of going through making a 440 motion and vacating the conviction, let's have a stipulation among all parties to save resources for the court, to get the person out of jail if they shouldn't be there. Because for the past 28 years, the same system has gone on. So there may be people there, I'm not, I don't know personally, but there may be people there that do not belong there, or possibly are there because they don't have the money to pay bail Thank because you. they're too poor. Thank so you, that's Mr. how I would deal with the jail system. Thank you. Stop. Rikers Island is an abomination and it's unfit for human beings. And I agree with Councilman Lansman on this particular port point. I support the closing of Rikers Island. This question has come up so much during this campaign that I hosted a panel discussion with Justice by Design, which is a spinny documentary done by Public Square Media, to talk about what a new detention facility could look like where we are treating people who are accused of crimes and being detained like human beings. I think it's very important to have community input, and the community has to have a say as to what the design of any new detention facility looks like and how big it is. This affects Queens County, and we must have that community input. Thank you. 
I oppose the mayor's plan for building the new structures, especially uh, in the counties of uh, Queens. I, I think that's the wrong idea. I think I do believe it creates more uh, units of incarceration that we don't need. And my belief is that Rikers Island should close because I'm the only candidate on this stage that has actually walked the tears of Rikers Island and advocated for those individuals incarcerated in Rikers Island who have been subject to excessive force by correction officers. So I know firsthand the violence and the culture of violence that exists on Rikers Island. That's why it has to close. And we can use existing stock of, of detention facilities in all five boroughs and without creating these superstructures that just adds more units of, of incarceration that's unnecessary. Okay, before we move to closing statements, I wanna give my colleagues a chance to get in, get in on the fun of the lightning round. So you two want to think about a short answer question, Justice Hang and Mr. James. Well, I just read this quick announcement. Um, this event is going to be rebroadcast on QPTV on Thursday, June 20th at 6 p.m. That's Spectrum Channel 34, 1995, RCN Channel 82, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. So look for the rebroadcast on Thursday, June 20th at 6 p.m. Short answer, any lightning round, anything left? Yes, yeah, a very good question over here, and that Please. is, of course, that um, bail reform has now become the law. It's been statutorily amended. Now, there are going to be those, of course, who will not appear, and that is, persons released on their own cognizance will not appear. The law provides for three <coughs> degrees of bail jumping, which also includes um, not returning uh, on your own recognizance. Will you, as district attorney, prosecute those who fail to return to court? Mr. Nunes, we'll go right down. What I believe is that we have to look at the circumstances of the defendant, and it's not going to be a, an arbitrary program or policy like exists in the district attorney's office now, where an individual is automatically charged with bail jumping and automatically offered jail time on every bail jumping case with without regard to the underlying case, whether it was dismissed or not. And I think that's a wrong policy. So what I will do, I will take it on a case and case, case on a case and case basis, find out why the individual missed court, why the individual failed to to, to well, actually. How would you find that out necessarily? Once they return, because they will return at, at some point, you you will question the defense counsel and allow the individual to do it. A bench warrant will have been issued. A bench warrant. Be yes. yes, and they, and they will be returned. And upon return of the, on the warrant, we can we can explore with defense counsel as the circumstances. I'm sure the defense counsel is going to be more than willing to explain why his client failed to appear and rather not have additional pending charges against them. So in under circumstances where there are no excuses for if you fail to appear, we will consider charging that individual bail jumping. Okay, good. Same question, Ms. Kabat. Yeah. Uh, yes, so uh, we should be charging bail jumping as a very last resort. You know, after 30 days, you can um, charge bail jumping. And what we should be doing instead is being proactive and, and helping people get the things that they need to get back to court. Right, so for example, our bail funds have had great success in simply either providing metro cards, giving text and email reminders. We should be setting up people for success and giving them the things that they need to return to court because overwhelmingly, they want to come to court, they want to get a good outcome, and they want to return to their communities. So we need to be taking those steps first. All right, thank you, Ms. Malik. Bail jumping charges? Yes, so I believe in fundamental fairness and ensuring that we are prosecuting bail jumping charges where they should be prosecuted. However, I also believe that we should be looking at people, not just the cases, and not having a blanket policy where we're prosecuting bail jumping charges across the board. We should be looking to see why the person didn't return to court, what the circumstances surrounding his or her non-return to court were, taking those into consideration and making sure that we are providing support and services so that people can return to court when they need to come back. Thank you. Ms. Lansman, bail jumping? The reason in the council that we've expanded supervised release programs, established a city bail fund to pay bail for people who didn't have their own means, and did a, have done a whole host of reforms to, to the process of pay, paying bail is because most people do want to return to court. They want to get their case resolved one way or the other. They're willing to take their lumps if that's where the chips, uh, the chips fall. The current policy in the Queens DA's office to reflexively charge bail jumping on the 31st day mm -hmm. is a mistake. Each person's case needs to be evaluated on an individual basis. I would charge bail jumping only in the most egregious circumstances where someone is really trying to flee um, uh, from justice and not charge people who have missed a court appearance because they forgot or because they had a child care issue or they had a job issue. Um, we just pile on people 
the criminal justice system and, and grind them down, that is symptomatic of the way justice is done as Queens, and, and that is, I'm running to break that system. Right. But you wouldn't foreclose on it, though. You wouldn't. I wouldn't foreclose the possibility of any circumstance of, of, of never charging someone who is bail jumping. Yeah. There are people who legitimately are, are, are fleeing and, and utter, have utter disregard and contempt for the judicial system. That is a rare circumstance in my experience. Okay, yes. Ms. Lugo. I think it's important, you know, it's, it's a new law, and I, I uh, became a lawyer when Judge Bruce Wright, who was called Let Him Lose Bruce, back in 1984 would say, would not impose bail because he felt that he uh, discriminated against people, poverty, you know, and, and black and Hispanic people. And now, 2019, all these years later, now we have this law. Everybody's gonna have difficulty when it becomes law in January, but who's gonna have the most difficulty? Our judges, our respected judges, who are going to have to decide when to impose bail, when not to impose bail, even if you follow the law. And when they, and when you have a domestic violence case and you have an order of protection and you're concerned that the person is not coming back, is he gonna go out and harm the victim again? So you gotta look at all the factors. You have to take everything into consideration. That's why I know for a fact that our judiciary will work along with the DA's office and along with prosecutors to determine the best way to implement this tool this new law and how best to uh, deal with bail jumping and other issues. Okay. But we must always protect the victim. Yes, thanks. Mr. Lacey. As a judge, I was very uh, reluctant to issue bench, bench warrants. Mm -hmm. And when people came back, I was reluctant to put them in unless they did not have a good reason. And I would always look as a case by case basis as the DA as to why mm -hmm. somebody. I'm done. <laughs> Mr. Jensen. Uh, last year, the legislature uh, passed and the governor signed a, a bill which raised the age of criminal responsibility. So the age of criminal responsibility is now 18. However, there is a provision which provides that prosecutors may elect in certain instances, on certain offenses, to charge 16 and 17 year olds as adults. Would you charge any 16 or 17 year old as an adult? It's obviously the evidence. My policy is going to be that every case that comes in for a 16 or 17 year old is going to be the first to family court, where the services are provided uh, for the individual and their family to deal with the underlying issues that motivated and, and drove the misconduct. They will only be exceptions to that policy for violent crime to the extent of homicide and uh, serious rape. So as Deputy Attorney General overseeing juvenile justice reform, we have found out that the brain science behind the development of the adolescent brain doesn't fully occur until the age of 25. I firmly believe in treating children as children, and we should be looking to care and rehabilitation, which is what the juvenile justice system is supposed to do. So I would seek to make sure that all the cases that are appropriate get referred to family court, so that we can work with the children and make sure that we're caring for them, rehabilitating them, and providing them with the services that they need so that they are not saddled with a criminal conviction for the rest of their lives that negatively impacts them. We have to look at uh, these cases on a case-by-case -case basis. While I believe there, sh there should be second and third chances, especially for young people, um, we all are to know are not aware of the gang problem that exists in Queens and there's 13 and others and they're all young people. So we have to look at cases on a case by case basis and decide. So will I refer to family court? Yes, however, if it involves homicides, rape, violent offenses, then we seriously must consider um, going prosecuting those cases as an adult. Mr. Lisa? Those decisions are very tough. Those are very tough, especially with a very heinous set of facts. I participated in those discussions many times in the third floor conference room with Judge Brown, and everyone said their piece, and then Judge Brown made the decision, mm -hmm. as it should be. That's why this is not a job for a politician. That DA himself or herself has to make that decision. And if you've never done this, Yes, I would not preclude it. I would go on a case-by-case -case basis. 
because each set of facts and each accused are different. So I'm not going to make any blanket statement about that. Mr. Lampton. Mr. Lampton. Yeah, respectfully, I don't view this as a hard question, and it's not a case-by-case -case basis. 16 and 17-year-old kids are kids. I was very proud to be an advocate for Raise the Age. Um, I understand that there are some of the most serious offenses, which some have mentioned this evening as being ones that they wouldn't send to family court or are already excluded from the Raise the Age statute, unfortunately. But in my view, every 16 and 17 year old who we do not let vote, we do not let drive, we do not let serve in the military, every 16 and 17 year old should be treated as a kid and to the maximum extent permitted by law, without exception, reservation, or qualification, every child will be sent to family court. That is what it means to treat kids as kids. Ms. Kabat? I agree, every child should be sent to family court. You know, this idea that, that you can't, one, combat our system of mass incarceration and the over-criminalization of our black and brown communities and low-income communities without dealing with not just nonviolent crimes, but applying these types of reforms to violent crime as well. And then also understanding that we spent too long in this binary system where our justice system, we say, hey, there are good people and there are bad people, and we just lock up the bad people, right? This is really just about people, and especially children. We should be saying that we should be investing in people's humanity and, and giving them the supports that they need to change behavior and really be able to engage with the world in healthier ways. This is about supporting folks and especially supporting children. So no, I will not charge children as adults. Okay, we are gonna now move to closing statements and each candidate will be given one minute uninterrupted time for a closing statement. I'm gonna start with Ms. Caban and work our way down. Uh, thank you. And, and again, I just want to thank everyone for being here and, and for allowing me to, to speak with y'all. Um, you know, the way that I see this is that we have a once in a generation opportunity to bring transformative justice to our borough. Uh, and the most important question you can ask as a voter in ending our system of mass incarceration is who do you trust to do these things? Because at the end of the day, when we talk about criminal justice reforms, the new way of prosecuting, this 21st century prosecutor idea, again, these are literally the things that public defenders have always known and have always fought for on the front lines, in courts, and up in Albany for decades. And the truth is that the differences between me and the rest of the field are massive. In a field of career prosecutors, career politicians who have built, fed, and thrived in our system of mass incarceration, I am the only public defender. What I represent is a clean, bold break from the status quo. What I represent is not incremental change, but transformative change. I'm really proud to have the support and endorsements of groups like Vocal New York and Make the Road directly you, impacted folks, um, like Youssef Salam, one of the Central Park Five exonerees, and, and Khalif, uh, Khalif Browder's brother, uh, Akeem Browder, Thank as well you, as some Mr. really great elected <laughs> officials, but I hope to earn your support as well. This is too important a race, so thank you. Mr. Lansman. Come June 25th, the first question you have to decide is not which candidate you want, but what kind of criminal justice system you want. Go to the polls with the motive and the intention of electing a new criminal justice system, one that's fair, one that's equitable, one that isn't racist, one that, does, one that doesn't discriminate against poor people, and one that actually works to protect working people, women, immigrants, homeowners, and tenants who under the current criminal justice system are not being protected. And once you make that decision, I think the second decision to elect me as the district attorney flows naturally. Of all the candidates who are running, I've got the record of enacting and implementing and affecting criminal justice reform. You don't need to look at my background and think, well, based on that, I think that he will do this. I've been doing the work of combating over-policing and mass incarceration, combating cash bail, protecting women, protecting our immigrant communities. With me, you know what you get on January 1st, 2020, radical, transformative criminal justice reform here in Queens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lansman. Mr. Lasek. Uh, being a DA is a job for a prosecutor. It's a serious job. Primary job is to keep the community safe and to make sure law enforcement doesn't overreach its authority. My leadership skills are unmatched here. 19 of the 25 years in the DA's office, I was a bureau chief or an executive assistant DA. 
As a Supreme Court judge for almost 15 years, I left as the Deputy Administrative Judge. I'm the only person up here found well qualified by the Queens Bar Association, and I'm not even a member. You're asking for reform? Who else would you rather have reform a system? Someone who knows it and is tough and knows how to get things done, or someone who's never worked in it and no idea how to run the DA's office? When I was freeing those innocent men, I, gave a, I used to give talks to the homicide force in the PD. I went down there one day and talked about the innocent men. One of the detectives on one of those cases came running up and tried to assault me right in front of the class. Thank God, Lieutenant Stanley Carpenter was there to stop him. Thank All you, right? Mr. Lacey. So, you want a man who's going to get things done? I'm your man. Thank you. Ugo. I believe in true justice for all. I've been a lawyer for 35 years. I started the first Hispanic woman known law firm in New York, a check on Ugo at One World Trade Center. I'm the youngest of six children. My mother came here from Puerto Rico with a fourth grade education. Born, I was born in Elmhurst, raised in Bedford Stuyvesant. I am proud to have the endorsement of Congressman Adolphus Towns, Assemblywoman Latrice Walker, Assemblywoman Joanne Simon, and many others, such as Louis A. Gonzalez, people that have been the front, on the front lines of the, the civil rights movement and are products of the civil rights movement. First Hispanic judge, first uh, black congressman, I worked on Charlie Chisholm's campaign. I'm a fighter. I represented all the victims in the Cypress Hill Cemetery case where they were burying blacks and Hispanics in garbage. When the AG's office and the DA's office and the mayor's office did nothing, I took that case with my business partner and we fought that case. Why? Because it was an injustice to people. When they were loan sharking people, we, fought, we founded new law in federal court on economic fraud. I am experienced in different facets of law, not just criminal law. You, I Ms. am Lugo. a bar association leader and I am the best candidate. Please vote for me June 25th. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there hasn't been a competitive race for district attorneys since 1977, 42 years ago. We cannot wait another 42 years for transformational change in the DA's office. We cannot go with an establishment candidate and a career politician. Change needs to come now. I am the only candidate in this race who's worked on both the defense as well as the prosecution side. I've worked alongside police officers. I've also held them accountable. I'm the only candidate in this particular race who has looked into the eyes of a woman who was raped, a child who was abused, a victim of police misconduct, and the wrongfully convicted and promised all of them I would get them justice. I was asked to stay out of this race, but I cannot sit on the sidelines seeing who is involved in this race and who is at the top of the ballot. I'm at the bottom of the ballot out of the seven candidates, and on June 25th, I'm asking you to make sure that Queens and the Queens District Attorney's Office reflects the communities that it serves, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. David. I bring the right balance of experience that ensures public safety and a commitment to criminal justice reform. I bring that right balance because I have 18 years experience as a criminal prosecutor, and I've done it not at the Queens DA's office where we have regressive policies, but at the U.S. Attorney's office, at the New York State Attorney General's office, and at the Brooklyn District Attorney's office. All progressive prosecutorial offices, all offices that have been leaders in diversion, have been leaders in doing the right thing, open file discovery, and, and fairness in the criminal justice system. That's where I've learned my, my, my trade, and that's where I've tra been trained. And it's so important to know that I also have the life experience to change the criminal justice system. Why is it an individual is gonna change the system because they felt the discrimination? I'm the only man on this stage, I'm the only person on this stage who has felt the discrimination of the criminal justice system because I've been stopped and frisked by the police. I've been asked to be put in a lineup. I've seen firsthand how the system can fail because of the way you look and because of the color of your skin. That's why I'm gonna change the criminal justice system, to make it fair, not just for me, not just for my family and my children, but for everybody who lives in our community, everybody who lives with the experience you, of Mr. growing up Davis. in an America that is black, white, and all colors. Thank you. Before we adjourn, please join me in giving a round of applause to our guest panelists. Yeah. And presence. Uh, just another couple quick thank yous before we adjourn. I want to thank all of you for coming out. I want to thank Queens Public Television, 
I want to thank Queens Daily Eagle, all of the good people at the NAACP here in Queens, also the folks here at St. John's, the facilities department, the IT department, the performing arts department, who all worked together to put this event together. Our public safety in the back, thank you. Thank you one and all for coming out. Tuesday, June 25th, don't forget to vote, and thank you to the candidates. Let's hear it.